Okay, so tonight I'm going to give us a little intro, give a little introduction to astronomy, uh, introduction to what we would call creation astronomy. Now, science is very important for a person of faith. I, I, I know this well. I'm a science teacher here at Cedar Park Christian Schools, and I mean, and, and science is very important for a person of faith for a number of reasons. I mean, uh, we need to reconcile the conflicts that exist today between what is being taught as natural history by your natural scientist and the Bible. We need to reconcile the conflict that, that exists between the biblical history and uh, the history that's been taught as natural history today. We need to reconcile these conflicts, and so science is important for that reason. But it's also important because it's through science that we're learning about God's creation. That's what we're exploring in, in, in science is we're exploring God's creation. And so through a scientific exploration of his creation, we're learning about the many wonderful things that God has made. And through that, we can develop a better appreciation of, of our Father in heaven. Well, astronomy, the discipline of astronomy, is, a, is involved with observing and explaining the behaviors of the celestial bodies in the, in, the, in the universe. The word astronomy means law of the stars. See, it is well recognized that the universe follows laws. The word astronomy itself means law of the stars. It is, uh, the universe is a, is a cosmos, not a chaos. It is ordered and, and, and runs just like clockwork. Well, by exploring these laws, we're learning about God's created word. So you could argue that the word of God exists in three forms. There's the written word, the Bible. There's the living word, his son. And then there's the created word that became his word, that became the creation itself. God constantly upholds the universe by the word of his power. In Genesis 1-3, it says, <clears throat> let there be light, and there was light. Psalms 33-6 says, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made. Their starry host by the breath of his mouth. The opening book of the Gospel of John states that in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So the word of God is evident in the complexity that we see in the universe, which again runs just like clockwork. It's not the random chaotic mass uh, that one would expect formed out of a great cosmic explosion like the Big Bang. It's a cosmos. It's not chaos. Humans have long struggled to explain the precision of the cosmos through various cosmological models. Nikolai Copernicus, shown here, is responsible for our current model of the solar system and is considered the found, to be the founder of modern astronomy. He referred to the cosmos as built for us by the best and most orderly workmen of all. Scientists describe this clockwork precision through what we, what we call scientific laws. Again, the word astronomy means law of the stars. These laws are descriptions of observed phenomena that are generally accepted to be true and universal and are often expressed in the terms of a single mathematical equation. For example, Sir Isaac Newton devised an equation that calculates the strength of gravity based on the mass and distance between two objects and or his famous second law of motion, force equals mass times acceleration down there on your lower right, or Einstein's equals mc squared, his mass energy, energy, mass energy equivalence formula, or the ideal gas law you see up at the top, PV, PV equals nRT. It has been argued that the, it was the belief in a lawgiver that was in fact the basis for the concept of the scientific law that the cosmos would be governed by unchanging constants flowed rather freely from a belief in God. Rather than chaos, randomness, and disorder, as one would expect in a universe birthed out of a cosmic explosion, we find clockwork precision governs the universe at every level. In fact, prior to the 20th century, the majority of scientists and most of the founding fathers of the various science dis disciplines believed that the God of the Bible created the cosmos. Most were very committed to God and, for, and, and Christianity. Moreover, because they believed the cosmos was designed, they expected that it would be intelligible to the human intellect, which led to the scientific revolution. Many viewed that by investigating his creation, they were getting to know the mind of God. People like Johannes Kepler, Robert Boyle, Galileo, Gregor Mendel, and Sir Isaac Newton. Arguably, the vast majority of the founding members of the various science disciplines believed in God and were very committed to God, and for most, Christianity. In addition to being the founder of many of our scientific laws, 
the first, second, and third laws of motion, Sir Isaac Newton was also the co-inventor of calculus. He said this about our solar system. This most beautiful system, he said, of the sun, planets, and comets could only proceed from the counsel and d- dominion of an intelligent being. He also said that all of his discoveries were made in answer to prayer and that he reads the Bible, da- read the Bible daily. Again, most of the founding fathers of our various science disciplines believed in God. In contrast to today, where scientists talk like you can't even be a scientist without holding to philosophical naturalism. This, such a view flies in the face of the history of science. But arguably, uh, again, the vast majority of the founding fathers of our very science disciplines believed in God, and it was, in fact, the belief in God, a lawgiver, that was responsible for the scientific revolution that gave us much, much of our scientific learning that we have today. Well, we also want to talk about per- the purpose of the cosmos. Because, see, everything that God made has a purpose, unlike the view of natural science, which argues that there could be many things out there that have no purpose. Only a, a scientist that's committed to naturalism, that, and only a scientist that holds to an atheistic worldview would assume that there is, for example, junk DNA, that there's DNA that does not have a purpose. But any creation scientist would assume that everything God made has a purpose. Well, what, do, what about the uh, purposes of the celestial bodies? Do they have a purpose? Uh, a biblical or otherwise, the astronomical bodies were formed on the first day of creation, on the fourth day of creation, excuse me. In Genesis 1, 14 to 19, it describes their various purposes. And God said, let, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years, and let them be for lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, and it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night, and the stars also. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening and there was morning, the fourth day. Well, the moon was created to be the lesser light to rule the night. Our moon is at exactly the right size for the earth. The moon is the fifth largest in our solar system, but is by far the largest relative to its planet. For comparison, our moon has a radius of 27% of the earth. The next largest moon in our solar system relative to a major planet, that being Titan of Neptune, has a diameter that's just 5.4% of Neptune's. The moon's diameter is over 50% greater than that of the dwarf planet Pluto, in fact. Well, our moon is at exactly the right distance, not just the right size, but it's also exactly the right distance. The moon, see, provides a gravitational force that creates tides and tidal currents. It's close enough so that it creates gravity uh, that creates these tides and currents in, our, in our, the Earth's oceans, preventing stagnation, but it's far enough away so the tides are not harmful to us. The moon's size and distance is also just right to stabilize the Earth's tilt, which is responsible for our seasons. The seasons of the Earth are caused as the Earth, as the Earth tilted on its axis, travels in a loop around the sun each year. Summer summer happens in the hemisphere tilted towards the sun, and winter happens in the hemisphere that's tilted away from the sun. So as the earth travels around the sun, the hemisphere that is tilted towards or away from the sun changes, giving us our seasons each year. We also use the moon, as well as the sun and the stars, as a calendar. Genesis 1.14 says, Let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them serve as signs to mark days and years. This is one of the purposes of the moon. Well, the, uh, the day is one complete rotation of the earth on its axis. The month is a complete revolution of the moon around the earth. The year is a revolution of the earth around the, around the sun. So the day, month, and the year are all based on astronomical movements. But where did we get the idea for the week from? What astronomical observations can be used as a basis for the seven-day work week? Well, actually none, because the seventh-day week is based solely on the Bible. Exodus 20.11 is the fourth commandment, 
of the Ten Commandments. And here we are, to, we are told to work for six days and to rest on the seventh, which is the Sabbath or Shabbat. Well, why are there other planets in the solar system? What purpose do they serve? Well, there are four inner terrestrial planets, rocky planets, that is Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, and four outer gas giants. Those are Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Well, the model can help us better appreciate the enormous size of the solar system. It will help us speak to, their, to the purpose of these planets. The yellow orbits that you see here in this diagram are the orbits of Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. The sun is 73 million miles away from Earth. A jet traveling at 600 miles per hour would take over 17 years to fly from the Earth to the sun. The green orbits are those of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, and Pluto. If you reduce the size of the solar system to one billionth of its present size, the Earth would be about the size of a grape, and Jupiter would be about the size of a grapefruit and would be five blocks away. Well, everything beyond the orbit of Neptune are, are just collectively referred to as trans-Neptunian objects. Pluto is 3.7 billion. Traveling at the maximum speed of the Apollo would take 17 years to reach Pluto. The fourth, uh, the, the red object you see there is the orbit of Sedna, which was discovered in 2003. It's one of the most distant objects known to the solar system. Its orbit is estimated to have a diameter of about 96.5 billion miles and to take approximately 12,000 years to complete. Well, astro astronomers have determined that the other planets in our solar system stabilize the distance of the Earth from the sun. They do have a purpose, keeping the Earth from approaching too close and moving too far away from the sun. They also protect the Earth from comets, meteors, and asteroids. God created for us a remarkable solar system positioned around the sun uh, that, and, and perfectly formed in position. Our space telescopes and spacecrafts have given us close-up views of these planets shown here that were only seen before now as pinpoints of light. Really, it is truly amazing to live at a time when technologies have allowed us to see and investigate parts of God's creation never before seen. Truly, God's handiwork has been revealed to us like no other time in the history of the earth. Well, another important purpose for the celestial bodies is to serve as signs. God said, let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night and let them serve as signs to mark sacred times and days and years. Well, the constellations are perhaps important for this purpose. Now, these con constellations are groupings of stars that form a pattern and have been named after animals or people in stories. For example, constellations have been historically used to designate an area in space. So we identify where things are in, in astronomy based on where they fall within these constellations. Um, so we have, uh, for example, the constellation Virgo that you see here. Here's another constellation. That's uh, the lion, Leo. Another constellation, uh, this is of Orion. We're going to look at uh, Orion, the constellation that forms Orion here in a little bit later. Well, this video shows the various constellations and the, and the planets that pass through those constellations. So our, our solar system, you may, may know, is forms a great plane. It's what they call the plane of the ecliptic. And as the various planets um, orbit, around the, or orbit around the sun, they pass through these, the, 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 the constellations that are also in this plane of the ecliptic. And it is perhaps the uh, passing of these planets through these constellations that were prophetically used. We can, we can see many of these constellations mentioned in the Bible. For example, Pleiades and Orion are mentioned several times, including uh, twice in the book of Job. He who made Pleiades and Orion, and who turns midnight into dawn and darkens day into night, who calls the waters of the sea and pours them out over the face of the earth. The Lord is his name. Or, for example, Job, he, he mentions also the maker of the bear and Orion. 
Pleiades and the constellations of the south, they're mentioned again here. Well, one important prophecy uh, heralded by the stars was the birth of Jesus. <clears throat> here is told of in Matthew 2. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of, of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. Well, although there is, has been a tendency, even amongst uh, creationists, to search for natural causes to the events in the Bible, um, the, his, you know, uh, miraculous events in the Bible, such as the star of Bethlehem or the various plagues in Egypt, um, it, it, it sounds more likely to me that this star was of his supernatural origin. Now, some have argued that what was just happening here was a conjunction. We know that Jupiter, uh, that there was a conjunction between Jupiter and Mars, for example, around the time that, uh, that the Christ was to be born, and some argue that it was a conjunction of Mars and Jupiter that was a brighter star in the sky that was perhaps seen by the Magi. But I think there's several elements of the description of this star here that call for a supernatural event. And again, there's just a terrible tendency that people have, uh, have gone through in history trying to give natural explanations for every miraculous event in the Bible. And that includes the drying out of the Red Sea. When the Israelites crossed over the Red Sea, the drying out of the Red Sea has been argued to be just a natural event. But I think what you're looking at here is something a little different. And there's several reasons for this. Um, the star did not just lead the wise men to Israel. But the wise men, after going and seeing Herod, the star appears before them again and leads them to Bethlehem. Now, Bethlehem is only about six miles down a well-paved Roman road. Now, uh, the wise men stopped at Herod. They talked to Herod. Herod talked to, the, to, the, to his wise men, found out where the Christ was to be born. They told him that the Christ was going to be born into Bethlehem. So he communicates this to the wise men. But you can actually see Bethlehem from Israel. From the hilltops in, in Jerusalem, excuse me, from the hilltops in Jerusalem, you can actually see Bethlehem. It's that close. It's six miles down a well-paved Roman road. You wouldn't need anyone to tell you how to get to Bethlehem if that's where you were going because it's down that road. All you got to do is follow that road to the next town, and you're going to be in Bethlehem. So, but the star appeared before them again in Jerusalem and led them to the place in Bethlehem where the child was. Not just to the region in Israel where the child was, but led them from Jerusalem, Jerusalem, six miles down the road to the place in Bethlehem where the child was. To me, I think there's something supernatural that had taken place there. This was not just a star that they followed from Persia up around the, uh, the, the Fertile Crescent to reach, uh, you know, to reach Israel. That something in tremendously important had happened here. A very unique star appeared that led the wise men through Jerusalem. It... Uh, Apparently, Herod's wise men were unable to see the star, even, even after they uh, stopped, stopped and, and talked to Herod. Apparently, Herod's wise men couldn't see the star that uh, they followed to, uh, to Bethlehem, to the place where the child was. So, I don't know, there's, there's points of disagreement about this. Um, like I say, people want to give natural explanations to supernatural events in the Bible, and this is one of them. But I think something very special happened here that brought those wise men to the exact location in Bethlehem where that child was, was living. Well, let's look at, note here uh, at uh, also how big Jer uh, Jupiter is in comparison to the earth. Here again, we're, we're looking at the Bible for its purposes, and one of its purposes here is, uh, I think, is clearly spelled out in the Psalms to declare the glory of God. And so to do this, let's, we're going to be looking at how big things are. Note how big a uh, J Jupiter here is in comparison to the earth. Jupiter's diameter is more than 11 times that of the Earth. 1,300 Earths could fit within the volume of Jupiter. But even Jupiter is dwarfed when compared to the Sun. Jupiter is about one-tenth the diameter of the Sun. Now, the Sun is an enormous fireball, a ball of plasma or charged gas that provides the Earth with the perfect amount of heat and light through thermal nuclear fusion reactions. As far as we know, the sun is fusing hydrogen atoms together to make helium, and that fusion reaction produces this enormous amount of energy that gives us heat and light. Well, these are real images that you're seeing here. 
These are real images from, the, from NASA's Solar Dynamics Observatory, which has been providing us with unprecedentedly clear and detailed pictures of these massive explosions. I wanted to let this just run a little bit because some of these images of these uh, solar flares is what you're looking at here. These enormous solar flares that emit from the surface of the sun fall back to the sun as prolonged rainfalls. That's what they look like. These enormous solar flares shoot up, and then there's just an extended period of like what appears like rainfall coming down from these solar flares for, an ex for extended periods of time. I've, uh, again, you can find these videos online. These, this is from NASA's Solar Dynamics Observatory, if you want to go in and find more of the videos from this segment. Well, when compared to the size of the Earth, these eruptions that we call solar flares help illustrate just how big the sun is. Note how much bigger when, when compared to one of those solar flares. The sun is 109 times the di diameter of the Earth. 1.3 million Earths could fit within the volume of the sun. And the sun is, is a very, very special and unique star in many respects. 93 million miles from Earth, sunlight is our main source of energy. Energy leaves the sun at the ferocious rate of 5 million tons of matter per second. This goes on day and night, year after year. There are many examples of God's power in nature. The whole universe came about by His Word. Psalm 33, 9 says that God spoke and it was finished. He commanded and it stood fast. As one good example, consider our nearest star, the sun. The sun gives off more energy in one second than mankind has produced since Adam and Eve. The sun actually provides its energy by nuclear fusion, converting hydrogen into helium on a grand scale. And uh, this is true of all the stars. In our own Milky Way galaxy, we estimate 100 billion stars. And beyond that in deep space, we see 100 billion more galaxies. One cannot begin to grasp the kind of energy and power that we're talking about, all created by God's Word. perspective with the aid of computer animation let's now travel with the earth to the sun at 100 times the speed of light from this view we begin to appreciate the magnitude of our home star over 1 million earths would fit inside the sun yet our sun is an average size star Many stars in our own galaxy dwarf it. Arcturus is the fourth brightest star in the night sky. Though 200 trillion miles away, this orange giant is visible to the naked eye. By moving our sun next to Arcturus, we can grasp its immensity. Arcturus is 100 times brighter with a radius 20 times greater than the sun's. Yet even Arcturus appears small when compared with the supergiant Betelgeuse. Betelgeuse has a radius 600 times that of our sun. A reddish star, it shines a remarkable 60,000 times brighter than the sun. However, even Betelgeuse is not the largest star in our galaxy. Several red supergiants in the Milky Way are even larger. Some with a radius 1,500 times that of our sun. Well, one of the things in creation that I think really exhibits God's power is the power released in stars. Uh, the sun, it releases more energy in, in one second than a billion major cities on the Earth, if there were a billion, would produce in a year. And that's just released in one second. You can imagine that. Of course, there are stars that are even more powerful than the sun. And just imagine all that power. All those stars, billions of stars in our own galaxy, billions of stars in other galaxies. And yet the Bible describes the creation of all that energy, all that power with the single phrase, He made the stars also.
When we consider that these ratios present only a sliver of our Creator's power, certainly we can agree with the psalmist when he exhorts, Let all the earth fear the Lord. Of course, the stars reveal more than raw power. Without the light of the sun, all life on earth would soon perish. The sun's life-giving energy provides a constant reminder of our Creator's steadfast love, the God who shines His gift of light on all. Well, such an enormously powerful sun. We're switching, uh, switching mics, so, all right. With such an enormously powerful sun, it should not be surprising that the Earth would have to be equipped with something to protect us. I mean, the thermonuclear fusion reactions from the sun create an enormous amount of radiation. Well, God has provided us with a very special planet that protects us from this radiation in the form of our magnetic field. See, we don't have a magnetic field just to use uh, compasses. It, the magnetic field of the Earth actually creates a tremendous shield around the Earth called the magnetic magnetosphere that protects the Earth from cosmic radiation. But it's, it's uh, important for, very special for other reasons as well, not just uh, its protective uh, magnetic field. It spins at just the right speed. A 24-hour period gives us darkness for a time, which is a good thing for rest. But if it were slower, like uh, 10 days, every 10 days, for example, we would have long, dark, and cold periods. Faster would cause violent winds. Our axial tilt also gives us moderate seasons. Our circular orbit gives us climate stability. Our, our Earth is the perfect distance from the sun. Any closer and water would boil away, any further away, and it would, uh, it would freeze. It's the perfect temperature, allowing for that all-important liquid water. All of these factors and many more are necessary for Earth's habitability because, as God said through the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 45, For thus says the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it, he, he that established it, he created it not in vain, but he formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, he says, and there is none else. Well, the earth is covered with water. The water is above the atmospheric or water vapor and the water is below. Oceans cover about 71% of the surface and water is truly a wonder of chemistry. There is in fact no molecule in all of chemistry just like water. There are many molecules similar to it, but it has these bizarre properties that causes it to stand out and apart from every other molecule in all of chemistry. I mean, there's nothing else like it. And it's because of this, most of our unit, units of measure that measure water are based on water. Let me give you some examples. It has a really high specific heat. This is the heat required to raise the temperature of a one gram of substance, one degree C, and water has a tremendously high specific heat. It has an enormous latent heat. That's the amount of heat that's uh, absorbed or released during a phase change. Evaporating water absorbs enormous heat that is released when uh, condensing. It also has a, a high surface tension, uh, allowing it to support objects. It, it is the universal solvent. Me, a great many uh, of our biochemical reactions, all of them, in fact, take place uh, dissolved in water. And it's able to participate in all-important hydrogen bonding, which gives all of our big macromolecules stability. But perhaps the most important purpose of the heavens is summarized in Psalms 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the end of the world. Psalms 56 says the heavens proclaim his righteousness for he is a God of justice. The heavens are the only part of the God's creation said to declare his glory and his righteousness. Well, for one thing, the heavens have revealed to us just how big and how powerful our God is. The earth we cherish so much is actually really very tiny when compared to the other celestial bodies, as we've seen. <clears throat> 
The sun, though enormously large and powerful, is small in comparison to some other stars. For example, 640 light years away is the Orion constellation, which uh, includes an enormous uh, star right uh, where I've circled it there in its upper right hand called Betelgeuse. Betelgeuse is 1,100 times the diameter of the sun and could uh, contain more than 1.6 billion suns within its volume. The sun, our sun, is actually considered a small star classified as a yellow dwarf. Betelgeuse is a red supergiant, one of the most largest and most luminous stars we know of. But there are objects even bigger than these stars. Within the Orion constellation outlined for you there is the Orion Nebula. The Orion Nebula spans 13 light years across, traveling at the speed of light, that is a, a, a speed of 186,000 miles per second, traveling at 186,000 miles per second, it would take 13 years to get from one side of this nebula to the other side of the nebula. Now, nebula like this are gas and dust clouds that result from stars that have exploded or gone supernova. The Eagle Nebula shown here is even more massive than the Orion Nebula. It spans 50 by 70 light years across. I'm going to isolate a little portion for you there. That little portion that I've circled in yellow for you there is called, uh, that little portion is called the Fairy of the much larger, larger Eagle Nebula. That portion right there spans 10 light years tall. It, that little portion right there is 8.5 million times larger than our solar system. If you were to put an image of our solar system on that one, you could not even see it, not even as a pinpoint of light. Well, of course, these stars and these nebula are found within our own galaxy, a galaxy that we call the Milky Way, shown here. The concentrated portion of the Milky Way is shown there above Monument Valley, Utah. Well, the Milky Way is a barred spiral galaxy believed to be about 100,000 light years in diameter and contain an estimated 300 billion stars. Our solar system is believed to be positioned about right there, where I've circled it, in, uh, in a, the portion of the galaxy that's called the galactic habitable zone. For a size comparison, if the galaxy were the size of, if the galaxy were the size of North America, uh, the entire solar system could fit in a, in a coffee cup. If we left the Milky Way traveling at the speed of light, it would take 100,000 years before the size of the Milky Way galaxy would become recognizable to us. Well, galaxies are massive structures with lots and lots and lots of stars. Again, ours is estimated to contain 300,000, but there's an even more lar a even larger galaxy close to ours called Andromeda. Now, Andromeda can be seen with the naked eye if you know exactly where to look, but it is massive, believed to uh, contain an estimated one trillion stars, believed to be more than 220,000 light years across, about twice the diameter of our galaxy, and, uh, and, and believed to contain an estimated one trillion stars. This is one of the newest and uh, most detailed images of the Andromeda produced by NASA from the Hubble Space Telescope. And they, uh, they released this image just to show the immensity of the stars that are contained there. As we zoom in further and further and further into Andromeda, you just keep finding more and more and more stars. And remember, our God knows the number of the stars, and he calls each of them by name. Consider that. 30 million light years away, there's the Whirlpool Galaxy. I just want to look at a few more pictures of galaxies because I just love them so. At, uh, at these kind of distances, these kind of distances, this is about 300 million light years away now. At these kind of distances, you can get uh, uh, see several different galaxies in the same field of view. This is the famous Stevens Quintet, five galaxies there within the same field of view. Well, NASA did something even more remarkable than this. What they did was they left the Hubble Space Telescope trained on an area of space that was called, that's called keyhole space. It was an area of space the size of a grain of sand held at arm's length. NASA took the Hubble Space Telescope, they put it on an area of space the size of a grain of sand 
held at arm's length, an area of space that contained no astronomical objects. That's why they call it keyhole space. Trained it on that area of space that contained no astronomical objects and left it there for about two weeks. And they resolved this image. Far from being, there being no astronomical objects, far from it being keyhole space, what they in fact found was that an image that was full of galaxies. Everything on this image is a galaxy. Everything on this image is a galaxy. What's called a Hubble's deep field photograph. Well, astronomers are estimating the number of galaxies, estimated that the number of galaxies in this image was around 10,000. Thus, when they extrapolated that number over the entirety of the night sky, they estimated that there must be at least 100 billion galaxies in the universe. If there's 10,000 in this one image, an uh, image this, that was taken of, a, of an area of space size of a grain of sand held at arm's length, extrapolated over the entire of the night sky, they believe there must be at least 100 billion galaxies. And galaxies are believed to contain an estimated 100 billion stars each. This is uh, one of the newest maps of the galaxies that were released by NASA. A striking feature of this mapping project was the sheer absence of what's called homogeneity. The galaxies were not evenly distributed as they expected. They are gravitationally bound together, apparently, to form clusters, which are themselves loosely bound into superclusters, which are in themselves, in turn, seem to be aligning along, along some larger scale structures in the universe. Our galaxy is said to, the universe is said to be at least 78 billion light years in radius, or 156 billion light years across, to contain an estimated 100 billion galaxies, many with 100 billion stars each. And remember the words of the psalmist who says, God counts the number of the stars. He gives names to all of them. The universe is vast beyond comprehension and truly declares the glory of God. The visible universe contains more than 100 billion galaxies. Each of these galaxies has a diameter millions of trillions of miles wide, and each contains hundreds of billions of stars. Though incomprehensible, it is now estimated that the universe holds over a billion trillion stars. Long before the introduction of the telescope, scripture declared that man would be unable to determine the exact number because there are so many. Of course, the Creator knows the exact number, and Psalm 147 declares that He even calls each star by name. The power to create each of these stars, the wisdom to maintain their stellar courses, and the incredible beauty displayed throughout the universe combine to affirm the Creator's majesty and care. God has made the universe so vast. All man can do is just marvel at this universe, the vastness of it. And I say, God, you are so, you are so great. And I think of what David said, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have made, what is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that you should visit him? Well, it's estimated that there are over 100 billion stars in our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy. Uh, it's estimated that there are over 100 billion galaxies in the universe. Which the Bible tells us that as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are God's ways above our ways and his thoughts above our thoughts. So if you chew on that for a little bit, think about how big the universe is compared to the earth, which is just uh, the head of a pin by comparison. Just how big is God's universe? Traveling at the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second, we could circle the earth seven times in one second. However, to travel across the known universe at the speed of light would take 28 billion years or more. Today, most astronomers acknowledge that the universe appears to be expanding. This also agrees with the Bible, which says God stretches out the heavens like a curtain. 
there are some examples in the Bible of scientific foresight. One example that comes to mind in particular is in Isaiah 40, 22, which talks about God stretching out the heavens as a tent or as a curtain. And you might say, well, that, you know, that is written in a poetic way, so we gotta be careful. And yet there are at least 10 other places in the Bible where it talks about this, this stretching out of the heavens. And that's something that uh, was only discovered in the uh, 20th century when we found that indeed all the galaxies appear to be, or virtually all of them appear to be moving away from each other as if the entire universe is being, lo and behold, stretched out, expanded, just like the Bible says. And that's obviously not something that, that people could have observed in ancient times. That's something that had to have been revealed to them from above. Unimaginably large, containing spectacular galaxies, and stunning nebulae. Truly, the heavens declare the glory of God. Indeed they do. There's really nothing else in all of creation that does it quite like the heavens. <clears throat> well, I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about the Big Bang. I'm not going to go into this in any great detail, but a little bit. I'm going to cover this, though, at length in May. So, uh, But I want to give you a little, just a little uh, kind of a brief preview of what that program is going to look like. Well, various cosmological models have been, uh, have been proposed over the centuries. This is a first century Greek model of the cosmos um, that, has the, that has the universe as a geocentric model. The Earth, Earth, is, at, well, the Earth is at the center. Uh, visible uh, in, the, in the center are the four basic substances of which the Earth was thought to have consist. Earth, water, air, and fire are surrounded by the celestial bodies. You might be able to make out Luna, Moon, Mercury, Venus, Sun, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and the starry firmament after that. Well, ultimately, cosmology, like many other areas of science, are, is an attempt to ex answer the big question. Uh, in his book, A Brief History of Time, the well-known uh, British physicist Stephen Hawking identifies the ultimate question behind everything. He said this, Today we still yearn to know we are, why we are here and where we came from. In the last chapter of his book, he says this, <clears throat> Even if there is only one possible unified theory, it is just a set of rules and equations. What is it that breathes into the equations and makes a universe for them to describe? I mean, there is something more to the universe than just math and physics, than our chemistry. The handy space answer book sums up the origin of the universe this way. 15 to 20 billion years ago, a big bang or explosion occurred, creating the universe. Uh, the universe began as an infinitely dense, hot fireball, a scrambling of space and time. Well, this infinitely dense, hot fireball, known as the singularity, is said to have undergone a quantum fluctuation, resulting in a rapid expansion of both space and time. The basis for the Big Bang Theory, uh, that, uh, the which is the expansion of matter from a single point, is an observation that has been interpreted as due to an outward, outward movement or expansion of galaxies. And uh, thus, if the universe has expanded through time, then if we were to run that basic clock backwards, it would must mean that all the matter in the universe existed as one single point in the universe, that we call the singularity. At some point in the past, the entire universe would have uh, been a single point of highly dense matter. This sudden expansion of the universe, excuse me, this, uh, and does this uh, you know, sound like a miracle to us? Some think it does. This Big Bang sounds like a beginning, and it sounds like something miraculous might have happened. Paul Davies, a physicist and evolutionist, in his book, The Edge of Infinity, describes the Big Bang this way. He says, the Big Bang represents the instantaneous suspension of physical laws, the sudden abrupt flash of lawlessness that allows something to come out of nothing. It represents a true miracle, was it? Have we detected uh, the creation of the universe? Well, where did this idea come from, this, the Big Bang idea? Well, it came from this guy, Edwin Hubble, who uh, the, the Hubble Space Telescope was named in honor of. In the 1920s and 30s, Edwin Hubble, shown here, added tremendously to the field of astronomy. He greatly expanded the uh, known uh, stellar distance scale using the newly built 100-inch telescope uh, at the Mount Wilson Observatory, shown here. That's him uh, seated on his famous little wicker chair at that 100-inch telescope. 
He also helped identify, uh, um, uh, 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 he extended our, our knowledge of galaxies, which were previously believed to be a spiral nebula. He actually identified these, what were believed to be spiral nebula, nebula as actually entire galaxies, not in our own galaxy, but uh, separate from our own. So Ed, Edwin Hubble added tremendously to our knowledge of, uh, of astronomy. Truly, he did. But what he's best known for is his assertion that redshifted light from galaxies indicates that they are moving outward and in, in, that space is expanding. Um, in a famous 1929 paper, he describes what he called the law of redshifts, which soon became known as Hubble law. Let me explain what this is about a little bit. Redshift is a physical phenomenon similar to what is called the Doppler effect, experienced when the sound waves of a, a moving vehicle are compressed as it moves towards you and then stretched as it moves away from you. So you hear it going, Ew. that's what they call the Doppler effect. Um, so it just expressed there in, um, as it happens with sound waves. Um, but a similar thing happens with light. If a light source is traveling towards an observer, the frequency, the wavelength of its emitted light will become compressed, increasing its frequency of ray, increasing the frequency of the waves, becoming what, what's called blue shifted. The light actually changes color. You might know that the different colors of light are due to different wavelengths. So if a light is compressed, if its wavelength is compressed, it will look more blue to us. Conversely, if the source of light moves away from you, the wavelength of that light will be stretched and the white light will appear more red to you. Well, what Edward Hubble realized looking at these various galaxies was that many of the galaxies around us are red-shifted. This phenomena, this redshifted phenomena, has been observed in the light from galaxies. So a blue-shifted galaxy would mean it's moving towards Earth, if we saw one of those, and there are some galaxies that are blue-shifted. A red-shifted galaxy would mean that the galaxy is moving away from us. And most galaxies, not all, but most galaxies are observed to be red-shifted, which Edwin Hubble argued was due to, the out, was due to outward movement. This observation quickly became one of the chief evidences for the Big Bang Theory of Origins. The Hubble Law basically states that redshift is proportional to velocity due to expanding space, and therefore that their speed is proportional to their distance. Thus, redshifted stars are interpreted as due to the outward expansion of the universe from the Big Bang, and these galaxies... Uh, uh, and, and, uh, uh, and, and, and are used to calculate the distance of a galaxy from the Earth. So the more redshifted a galaxy is, the further away it, 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 appear, it is believed to be, and that redshift is being used today to, to, as an estimate of their distance. Okay? Well, the term Big Bang, you may not know, was coined by, this, by an, a famous astronomer that, by the name of Fred Hoyle. In a, a 1950 BBC a radio series titled The Nature of the Universe, Hoyle mockingly called this idea the Big Bang, considering it preposterous. He readily saw through the fallacious assumptions behind the Big Bang theory, saying this. In 1994, he wrote, Big Bang cosmology refers to an epoch that cannot be reached by any form of astronomy and... In more than two decades, it has not produced a single successful prediction. Well, is the Big Bang compatible with the Bible? This is something we ultimately want to, want to ask ourselves, and something I'm going to spend a little more time in uh, when I get back into this in May. Is it compatible with the Bible? The Big Bang theory argues for a sudden be beginning, this expansion of space and time that it indicates that, and uh, something seemingly flowed out of, uh, formed out of nothing. From something, uh, from nothing, something came, it would seem. And many people have asked this question. Um, to, to reconcile the conflicts that exist between natural history and biblical history, we need to interpret these kind of scientific findings ourselves, consistent with the biblical worldview. And so what about redshift? How should we be interpreting redshift consistent with the biblical worldview? Is it really evidence of an expanding universe? Well, interestingly, it is noted 17 times in the Bible that God stretched out the heavens. 
17 times in the Bible, it says that God stretched out the heaven. The word that is used is similar to the word that is used to describe how a, how a, a baker uh, spreads out dough, how that, how that dough is spread out in the same way. Several, 17 times we can find it referenced that God stretched out the heavens. Uh, for example, here in Isaiah and Jeremiah, there are a couple of uh, examples for you. Should, it, uh, is this is, is, is this biblical evidence that, that God created the universe in such a way that he stretched it out? Is that red ship that we're seeing evidence of this stretching out of the heavens that, that is described in the Bible? Well, since the Bible says that God stretched out the heavens, we, want, we need to ask that question. Is it, is it possible to reconcile these two views? Dr. Don DeYoung has a PhD in physics from Iowa State and is a professor uh, and department chair at Grace College and is the president of the Creation Research Society. He says there may be in, indeed be a purpose for the expansion. He says, in the creation view, universe expansion may, may well be a reality, but the Big Bang interpretation is entirely unnecessary. Instead, the universe was most likely created in an expanding mode for stability. Without expansion, gravity would cause the universe to begin to collapse back on itself. Many other motions, like the orbits of planets and the rotation of stars and galaxies, also serves the same function of providing a stable, dependable universe. So, it could be. That, that the universe is expanding due to stability. However, we encounter serious difficulty in reconciling these two views, that, that is the natural history view and the creation view, if we take the creation account in Genesis as historical. According to the Big Bang cosmology, after the explosion or uh, this, this Big Bang, there would have been a long dark period. Okay, this is how they say, this is the, the physics of this Big Bang. After the Big Bang expansion, there would have been a long dark period they call the Dark Ages on this diagram for, for literally hundreds of millions of years before the first star evolved through, they would argue, through purely natural processes. And after billions of years of star births and star deaths through thermonuclear fusion reactions, enough of the heavy elements would have been cooked up to form dust particles that could accrete into things like uh, planets and eventually form things like solar systems. This sequence of events that's been put forth by natural science is in direct conflict with the biblical story. Because, the first, because we see from the biblical account of creation that it wasn't until day four that the sun and moon and stars were created. All the astronomical bodies were created on day, day four. But according to Big Bang cosmology, after that initial expansion event, there would have been a dark period for hundreds of, billion, hundreds of millions of years before stars would have started to form. And then eventually, after literally billions of years of star births and star deaths, that enough dust of heavy elements would have been cooked up to form things like planets. But according to the biblical creation account, the first thing that was formed was the earth with both dry land and plants before the stars were made. That is made abundantly clear from the biblical account. Well, the leading theory put forth by natural science to explain the origin of stars is called the nebular theory. Now, the word nebular is Latin for cloud and refers to these gas and dust clouds. According to the nebular theory, stars are born from these dust clouds. Well, where do we get this view from? Let's, let's go into a little bit of history of the nebular view on star formation. Martin Rees, a leading researcher on cosmic evolution, makes the following claim about the Orion Nebula. He says, stars are still forming today. About 1,500 light years away lies the Orion Nebula. There's enough gas and dust to make millions of stars. It even contains protostars that are still condensing. Well, the nebula theory holds that, that our solar system and the sun and the planets formed about 4.6 billion years ago out of a swirling nebula that might have looked like this. As a nebula, it is believed that as the nebula rotated due to regional movements within the galaxy, it collapsed or became condensed, and it flattened into a disk. A central bulge in the middle formed and became our sun. 
Smaller collections of material away from the, the center then became the planets. This is the, what's called the nebula theory. Well, nebula, the problem is that nebula, like the Eagle Nebula, are claimed to, uh, claim to contain star-forming regions. For example, that uh, region that I've circled for you there, I will enlarge it for you. This is what's called the Pillars of Creation. This picture is. And NASA actually claims that the, this picture, the Pillars of Creation, has become one of the most famous images of modern times. Well, natural science argues that uh, it, it is in these regions that stars are forming. They claim that these illuminated portions of these nebula are proof, that there is proof here in this picture that stars are forming within these nebula. Well, the most popular uh, form of the nebula theory holds that stars form from these vast clouds of gas and dust through gravitational contraction. However, the problem with this theory is that gas pressures cause these clouds to spread out further, not contract. So there's a big physics challenge to the nebula theory in explaining how these gas and dust clouds contracted or got smaller, did not spread out. Nobel Prize winner Hans Alvin describes the theory as one of a hundred unsupported dogmas. He said this, there's a general belief that stars are forming by gravitational collapse. In spite of vigorous efforts, no one has yet found any observational indication of confirmation. Thus, the generally accepted theory of stellar formation may be one of a hundred unsupported dogmas, which constitutes a large part of present-day astrophysics. Fred Lawrence, uh, Fred Lawrence Whipple was an astronomer at the Harvard College Observatory for over seven years. He stated in the Smithsonian Institute Press that precisely how a section of interstellar cloud collapses gravitationally into a star is still a challenging theoretical problem. Astronomers have yet to find an interstellar cloud in the actual process of collapse, but they still teach that it happens. Well, numerous physical phenomena and processes have been invoked to explain the compression of a nebula to sufficient densities that would allow stars to form. In addition to gravitational-induced contraction, cooling has also been thought responsible for a collapse of a, a cloud of material, as well as a cosmic collisions with uh, other nebulae or with, uh, even with other galaxies. It is argued that uh, collisions between galaxies could cause enough of a force to uh, compress some of these uh, uh, nebulae together to uh, allow their density to reach the point where a star could form. Perhaps, it is, it is, uh, perhaps that is the case. Uh, they also invoke supernovas. This is, uh, has become one of those more popular theory. They argue that a supernova of a nearby star uh, as an agent to compress a nebula. And, uh, and, and this today remains the leading theory. However, note that with any of these competing star formation theories, stars are required. In this one, a, a star supernova is needed to form uh, a, uh, to compress a nebula that was formed from a star that went supernova. So you have a star that goes supernova creating a nebula, another star that goes supernova nearby compresses that nebula significantly enough for a star to form. But what about those first stars? What about those first stars that formed after that Big Bang expansion when there were no nebula yet that resulted from stars that went supernova? You get me here? Well, Dr. Don DeYoung, again, a professor and department chair at Grace College, he says this, the complete birth of a star has never been observed. The principles of physics demand some special conditions for star formation and also for a long time period. A cloud of hydrogen gas must be compressed to a sufficiently small size so that gravity dominates, he continues. In space, however, almost every gas cloud is light years in size, hundreds of times greater than the critical size needed for a stable star. As a result, outward gas pressures cause them to spread out further, not contract. Re well, the result of this expansion is a, what's called a supernova remnant. Uh, these nebula will eventually expand and expand and expand until they disappear completely. This one spans, this supernova remnant, a former nebula, spans 23 light years. 
23 light years, and is located in the large Magellanic Cloud, a uh, satellite uh, galaxy to the, our own Milky Way galaxy. Danny Faulkner holds a PhD in astronomy from Indiana University and taught at the University of South Carolina for over 26 years. He serves as the editor for the Creation Research Society Quarterly. Uh, by the way, we have some free issues of the CRSQ back there in the back uh, on their book table. Some of those, take those, some of those home with you. Those are free. He's an editor of the Creation Research Society Quarterly and has published over 100 papers in various journals during his academic career. He now works as a researcher and author and a speaker for Answers in Genesis. Well, he, uh, so he says this, most astronomers believe that, the cl that clouds gradually contract under their own weight to form stars. But this process has never been observed. But if it did occur, it would take many human lifetimes. He continues. It is known that clouds do not spontaneously collapse to form stars. The clouds possess considerable mass, but they are so large that their gravity is very feeble. Any decrease in size would be met by an increase in gas pressure that would cause a cloud to re-expand. So, but what about these interesting images that have been captured where we find more than one type of nebula overlapping? That's what's happening here. You have a, a, one of these dark, what's called an emission nebula, and, a, and, a, and a, a, there next to another kind of a nebula illuminating it. Are, there, are these really stellar nurseries, as NASA claimed they are? What is happening here when a dark nebula, which are mostly made of dust, collide with these emission nebula, which are which have fluorescent regions of gas glowing in the, in the presence of embedded stars, structures like the one found in the pillars of creation form. This is what we see. When you have these uh, dark and these emission nebulas in the same region, you're going to find these. Well, in Science News, Ron Cohen reported that the famous pillars of creation were vacuous. He stated this, NASA's claim in 1995 that these pictures showed hundreds to thousands of stars forming was based on a speculative EGG star formation theory, and it has recently been tested independently with two infrared detectors that can see inside the dusty pillars. What do they find inside the pillars of creation? Nothing. Very few stars were there, and 85% of the pillars had too little dust and gas to support star formation. The new findings also highlight how much astronomers still have to learn about star formation. Hmm. No stellar nurseries after all. In uh, Sad. Well, one of the biggest conflicts between natural science and... Uh, and creation science is the age of the cosmos. Now, I only have a, a couple of minutes that I, where I can touch on this, but I wanted to touch on it a little bit. The question we need to ask now, today, natural science teaches us that the Earth is 4.6 billion years old, and the universe is 13.7 to 13.9 billion years old. But how old does the Bible say the Earth is? Well, the Bible does say how old the Earth is. The biblical age of the earth is calculated using the genealogical record found in the Bible, using uh, ancestral information found in both Genesis 5 and Chronicles. The date of the flood can be easily calculated by adding the ages when the patriarchs in the line from Adam to Noah gave birth to their sons. So what you see here is the genealogical record from Adam to Noah. By simply adding up those ages, you can determine that the flood occurs in the year 1656. And this is how it's been done, using other genealogical uh, genealogies and key biblical events like the Exodus from Egypt. The year of the flood was calculated to be 1656 Anamundi, um, uh, which corresponds to 2348 B.C., with the creation occurring in the year 4004 B.C. You add 2022 to that and you get 6,026 years as best as we can calculate it, the age of the earth, 6,026 years old. There's a pretty sig significant difference between that and uh, 4.6 billion years old. Well, well some try to, uh, uh, now this, just so you know, this calculated 6,000 year earth age is based on a number of things. One of them is that the days of creation were actual 24 hour periods of time. But this is one of the big unknowns. Were these actual 24 hour periods of time? 
Some, as some argue that there's, there's actually a huge gap of time. Some want to add, in order to reconcile again the conflicts that exist between natural science and the Bible, um, one of the ways that people try to do this is they assume what scientists are teaching is true and then look to see how they can reinterpret the Bible to bring it into agreement. I say if we want to know, if we want to know the truth, we need to assume the Bible is true and reinterpret the scientific findings to be in, into agreement. And this is what we need to be doing. Unfortunately, a lot of people assume, though, that, that there must be, there, there's missing time from the Bible, that scientists are correct, and the earth is 4.6 billion years old, and so they look to see how they can add time to the Bible. Some add it by putting a, a time between Genesis 1 1 and 1 2. This is called uh, um, the gap theory, that there's a huge gap of time between Genesis 1 1 and 1 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and then 4.6 billion years old. Then the earth history it happens right there. And then they say Genesis 1-2 should be read, the earth became without form and void, and darkness over the face of the deep, the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. But some add time there. Uh, but the more common way to add time is to just argue that each day of creation was actually a vast span of time. That each day was a vast span of time. However, there's serious problems with this. Um, number one, the author of the book of Genesis defines what the word day means to us. Now, there's, how, there's, there's several ways you can determine what an author means by a word. Um, they can use it in context. You can use the exegetical approach to textual interpretation, which will, if you use that approach to, to the, interpreting the Bible, it will convince you that the earth must be very, very young. Or if, you, uh, if the author defines a word. And in Genesis 1, the author defines what the word day means over and over and over again. Over and over again. Evening and morning, the first evening and morning, evening and morning. The author is defining what that word means. And, and interestingly, too, if you'll note, remember that the sun, moon, and stars weren't created until day four. So the only reason the author has for say, saying evening and morning, day one, evening and morning, day two, evening and morning, day three, is just to, to define what the word day means. Now, God created language and created time and was describing the creation in terms that we could correlate to our understanding of time. And God described the creation of the world as occurring over periods of time we would equate to an ordinary solar day. Well, one of the most puzzling questions is astronomy, and is if the universe is relatively young, thousands of years old, and stars are millions of light years away, wouldn't it take light millions of, of light, might, millions of years to reach us? This is a big problem. Starlight and time has a lot of people really twisted up these days. The Earth must be millions of years old because it must take millions of years for that light to reach us. Well, there have, been, there have been several theories put forth to try to explain this away. Several different theories. These are the leading continue, contenders. On um, that God just created things with the appearance of age. Remember, he did create the world with the appearance of age. Created Adam, fully mature. Created the plants and animals of the Garden of Eden, fully mature. But the old age of the earth is really mainly due to misinterpretation of the flood geology. The, the flood, the flood rocks that buried the that, that flooded the, the rocks that are covering the earth, a misinterpretation of those has led to an excessive view of the age of the earth. But God did create Adam fully mature, created the plants and animals in, 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 in the Garden of Eden fully mature, created it with the appearance of age in that way. Some also argue for that the speed of light has changed over time, what's called C decay. Some argue for that. Um, others argue for relativistic effects. Um, Russell Humphreys um, published on what he called white hole cosmology, that at the beginning of the creation, the earth was in a huge gravitational well, causing time to pass more slowly in, the, in this gravitational well than it did in outer regions of the universe. And other people have, work, have followed up on his work. Uh, John Hartnett followed up on it, and, and Jason Lyle did as well. Uh, so there's a lot of work has been done there uh, to try to re reconcile Distant starlight in a young universe. But I like Danny Faulkner's take on this the best. Um, one of the things we got to remember is that uh, we, God is a God of miracles and that he is not bound by the laws of physics. God is not bound by the laws of physics. He was not bound by those laws when he created the universe. He 
instituted the laws of physics to sustain the universe after he created it. But God is not bound by the... He's a God of miracles and is not bound by the laws of physics. Moreover, uh, God used many processes during creation week that are different from processes that occur today. He didn't... Again, he didn't make Adam instantaneously out of nothing, but instead formed him from the dust of the ground. Uh, God used a similar process to create uh, the land animals and flying animals. And he caused the plants to grow rapidly out of the ground on day three. This is interesting. The phrase brought forth is from the Hebrew word dashab, which means to sprout or shoot. God rapidly and miraculously matured many things during the creation, re- creation week. So imagine a very rapid day three resembling a time-lapse movie of plant growth, for example. It seems both logical and theologically consistent that in a similar manner, God created, could have created these plants by rapidly maturing them and then bringing the light from distant objects to the earth in the same, in the same or similar manner so that the trees could instantly uh, sprout forth. Dr. Dr. Faulkner draws the comparison in his uh, 2013 article in Answers Research Journal. He says, the reason that plants plants made on day three could not develop at the rate that they normally do today is that they could not have performed their function of providing food on days five and six. The quickest developing fruit requires weeks or months, and trees require years to do this. In a similar manner, the stars could not have fulfilled their functions of marking seasons and days and years unless they were visible by day six. He continues, I propose that the light had to be abnormally, abnormally grow or sh- that, that, that the light had to abnormally grow or shoot its way to the earth to fulfill this function. Notice that this is not the result of some natural process any more than the shooting up of plants on day three was. Instead, this is a miraculous, abnormally fast process. Rather than light moving very quickly, I suggest that it was space itself that did the moving, carrying light along with it. So interesting. I like Danny Fogner's take on, on explaining distant starlight in young universe. I think, that's, I think he does one of the best jobs of explaining that. There are many brilliant astrophysicists out there that are creation scientists that are looking into the issue of, of a starlight, a distant starlight in a young universe. But uh, I, I think we would be a little naive to think we, we can explain how God did that. Uh, a lot of people are working on it. But um, I remember Jesus' first miracle was turning water into wine at that wedding of Cana. Remember that? Well, we, you cannot explain that miracle through physics. You cannot turn wine into water, or water into wine through physics. You cannot do it. And I, I don't care how much you know about winemaking, you're never going to be able to explain how Jesus turned water into wine. I don't care how much you know about physics, I don't care how much you know about winemaking, you're never going to explain that miracle. Why we would think we could explain through physics how God created a young universe, 6,000 years ago, is the universe 13.7 years, years old, or is it 6,000 years old? Well, I think the answer to that question is both. Was Adam 30 years old, or was he one day old the, the day he created Adam? Well, he was both. Did God create a 13.7 billion year old universe 6,000 years, years ago? Yeah, I say he definitely could have. Don't get all twisted up with the starlight and time problem, okay? Don't get all twisted up on that. Trust in the Word of God, because it's through the Word of God that we have truth, and that we know the true history of the world. Let me close in a word of prayer. Father, Father God, we thank you so much for your word, Lord, for, your Bible, for the Bible that has given us such tremendous insights. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for protecting it, from inspiring people to write it, for having it available to us. Father God, we thank you for your word, because through it, we, we truly have insight. Father God, we ask for additional wisdom and insight about this world, Father God, through your Holy Spirit. Pour pour into us wisdom through your Holy Spirit, Lord, and give give us insight about this world that we may be better and more effective witnesses for you, Lord God. Father God, help us, Lord, to be a witness for you. Help us to understand the science. Help us, Lord, to understand the science so that uh, we we, we can understand these arguments that are being used against your word. We can understand them. 
We can formulate arguments against them. And Father, we can be a witness for you, Lord God. Father God, help us to be a witness for you. Father, we want to serve you. Help us, Lord, not to shrink back from the science. Help us not to be shy. Help us to be bold in our, in our, in, in our knowledge that we do know the truth. That we live in a world that's lost. And we are in possession of a, of a precious truth that the world needs to hear. Help us to be bold, Lord, and to share this truth that we know. That you created this world. That you created it recently. That you created us. That you created us in your image to have a relationship with you. Father God, thank you, Lord, for this life that you've given us, for breathing life into these wonderful bodies. Thank you, Lord, for this world that you made for us. Father God, we praise you. We glorify and honor you, Lord God. Thank you so much. Father God, help us, Lord, to walk the path of righteousness, Lord, we ask. Help us, Lord. In Jesus' name, we ask all these things. Amen.